Thanks. Um, of course, I'm uh, not the person who did uh, all of the work on this. I have a big team, very bright people, uh, Dr. Peter Borobiev, uh, expert in flow, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Reda Taha, professional engineer. He's uh, one of the five top concrete experts in the world. Uh, Toivo Kalas and Eric Singsas from Algoma Algo Biotechnology. They're the bioreactor people. Uh, Anel Prinja, who's the chair of uh, nuclear science at uh, UNM, working a lot with Sandia National Labs. Uh, Christos, who's the dean of research. Uh, Christopher Dean Hall, who was the chair of mechanical engineering until this fall. Uh, David Hansen, also biotechnology, Maron Tarani, and Svetlana Poroseva, who've all contributed greatly to this effort, and I want to thank them. Um, first of all, what we're talking about is a design reference architecture. That doesn't mean it's a fact. That means it's, it's a standard for people to look at and modify. So this standard begins with a wall design which is multi-layered. The outside is a mylar <coughs> inflatable film, like the one you may have seen in the other uh, inflatable habitat uh, presentation. This is different because it has uh, al um, aerogel tape with superconductive uh, tape in it. Uh, that means it creates its own magnetosphere. And that means that when radiation, particularly ionizing radiation, as was in the talk earlier today, uh, comes to this structure, it goes around the structure instead of through it. Neutral radiation, neutrons, go right through. But uh, the most damaging radiation can be eliminated right at the surface. Then you have uh, structural aerogel, which provides you actual strength, the equivalent of concrete, but also provides insulation. It also does this while weighing about as much as air does. So it doesn't pay a big weight penalty like the metal spam cans that we're used to. Then there's a layer of water ice, which provides additional radioactivity and protection and helps protect against those neutrons coming through. But it also gives you something that's very important. In space, you need water. And having it stored around you helps protect you, but it also means you've still got the water with you. Inside of that, we have an algae bioreactor. What we have done is we've taught our walls to breathe. So they take the carbon dioxide out and give you oxygen back. So in a very lightweight environment, then protected by thermal aerogel and sprayed on tile in a nice pattern that uh, prevents people from doing drugs and walking through the facility at the same time. Um, this is the basic design of how we do walls. We apply that to a variety of different uh, situations. So what we've done is we've taken and made an adaptation to deep space long-term habitation, as we said, where there's no breathable air, where there's no or low gravity, where there's no radiation shielding, where there's no food or work, whether it's too, where it's too cold or too hot. This allows you to do things more flexibly. This is a expansion of this from the small scale to the system scale to see how you would apply this technique in space. In this case, we build space stations. We build bases on the individual planetary bodies. And we use cyclers, transport habitats, to go from location to location. We are not looking to do a one-off trip to any location. We are the Borg. We will assimilate you. Okay. We're going to take over the moon. We're going to take over Mars. And we're going to build the infrastructure for us to be able to do that. 
And again, this concept is from Buzz Aldrin. He has a very nice uh, video on his site of how the uh, cycler system works. To do that, you have to have a cycler. Um, and our design is quite different. Uh, you may notice Orion capsules parked here on the ends. Uh, that's because we consider them to be lifeboats. An Orion capsule in Earth orbit can land you on Earth. An Orion capsule on Mars will leave you as a nice raspberry stain for the Martian Navy to come and collect. Because they can't land unless they have a big water system and a naval armada to pick them up. Same problem on the moon. So hopefully, if you have an emergency in Mars or moon orbit, you get left in orbit. We need docking adapters to be able to uh, communicate with other craft, to be able to dock at the stations. Uh, we have those uh, emulated magnetosphere exteriors. We use, in this case, solar electric propulsion. We are not attached to any propulsion system. It can be nuclear propulsion. It can be MHD propulsion. We don't really care. The important concept is cutting the amount of time that it takes to get from station to station. Because our vision of this is not a government version of running all of this, not something done by NASA, but something that is done commercially, where perhaps NASA helps build the stations and the bases, but then government-owned, contractor-operated takes over and actually runs the thing, and these become the airlines of the space infrastructure. Side view of that shows the propellant tank, tanks down underneath, uh, which regardless of which way you do it, you've got to have. And we also emulate gravity the same way that uh, Dr. Zubrin does in his Mars Direct system by rotating around the center. Now, we don't use a tether. We have an actual shaft where if you have an accident in one part of the habitat, you can go down the shaft to the other side and still survive the journey. And we do that defense in depth, uh, a thing called islanding, um, so that you survive and get to your destination just like you would if you were on a tra traditional commercial aircraft. That means you have to have a space station to dock at. Now, we think that uh, one of these could be built off of the International Space Station, which is due to be decommissioned in the next six years, uh, and could replace it out at geosynchronous orbit, which is the appropriate place for a space station, not in low Earth orbit, but at the boundary of space. We prefer to call it Johnson Prime since it would sit directly over Houston and in geosynchronous orbit, it would always be directly above Houston. On the moon or on Mars, we would build bases that have a much more complicated structure. And the only way to show that really is in a schematic where we have individual functions, repair, transportation, storage, battery, power, uh, mechanical life support, uh, food, water, medical command, uh, power generation, biological food and uh, air and water purification, uh, Wi-Fi communications infrastructure, and places, kitchens, sleeping areas, shower and exercise areas. Since you're going to essentially be confined to the base unless you have a suit on, in both Mars and on the Moon, you have to have enough space so that you don't feel like you're living inside a casket. This is very important. It's important for the psychological ability of people to survive. You also have to have power, and you also have to have smelters and algae. We'll talk about the importance of that a little more later. But without smelters, you can't really build the bases that you need to, and you don't really have any kind of infrastructure. And without the algae, you don't really have the ability to do 
large life support or the production of fuels or uh, for those of you who like spirulina, you can use it to create food. Um, it's uh, an opportunity to start doing other things and have an economy. We start by teaching the walls to breathe. That way, every surface of the entire system takes the carbon dioxide that we exhale, turns it into valuable products, and gives us back oxygen. Now, we don't treat the biological support system, or the BLSS, any different than we do the mechanical life support system, or C ECLSS, because we believe both are necessary. You can't afford to have your air run out. You can't afford to have your water be poisoned. And that's true here on Earth just as much as it is, is in space. That means we use a facility like the Boeing uh, ECLSS. Um, it also means that you have to have something that purifies your air, and we like to do that and grow food at the same time. AeroFarms has a wonderful, um, these are two-story tall robotic facilities. They grow kale and lettuce and watercress <coughs> and all kinds of wonderful things. There's no reason why you can't feed yourself at the same time as you're cleaning up your air and water. So both aeroponics and hydroponics are part of this system. Uh, there's a lot more depth into that that I can't go into because I just don't have time today. Uh, but that's part of what our biological team takes care of. In the initial construction of this, uh, standards are important. This is where government actually has a role. <coughs> Standardize the doors so that everybody can use the doors, everybody can build the doors, and um, then you can take and put the mylar in between. You have the coils of the superconductive electromagnetic uh, magnetosphere emulation, which provides your radiation protection, <coughs> and that happens in between airlock units. These airlock units consist of four doors in a box. And that's your unit so that you can either go outside or you can go to a different segment of the, the base. We do that to provide defense and depth. If you have uh, a penetration or other kind of accident, you don't contaminate the whole base. You have separate chambers of air, which are all protected and separated from each other. We can do that by creating bases that have either 3D printed components where you print around that shell or you print and then put the shell inside either way or you do the inflated assembly where you then spray inside of it to turn it into a solid. So even though you have an inflatable habitat when you start it becomes a solid habitat so that you don't have the problems that many inflatables do. That means you can use little robots like these guys based on the spheres robots from the ISS which allow you to take and plug in cables or to take and spray your solids, your tile or your aerogel or your water ice. Um, in this way you can complete the assembly of your base and then send the people to walk in and turn the lights on because the base is already complete before the people arrive. On uh, planetary bodies like Mars and the Moon, you have to have something a little bigger to be able to do the work. Uh, we use uh, a cat-based track loader uh, to be able to grind out the area necessary for the base, to be able to scoop up dirt and move it. Um, it uses solar panels, and instead of an engine, it uses uh, high-capacity supercapacitors or batteries to be able to store the electrical charge. Same thing with the uh, material handler to be able to pick up 
those uh, four-door airlock units and move them into position. Um, so this is how we assemble the base with these two devices. The internal base robots are, uh, there's an EOD robot here, which is a model for the cable plugging robot, and then the internal sprayer. All of this is well and good, but it doesn't give you anything to sell. You can sell the food to yourself and consume it, but you don't really have an economy. To be able to even build the larger scale bases with concrete, you have to first make the concrete, because shipping concrete from Earth to Mars is going to be very expensive. It's much better to use what's already there. To do that, you need something like one of these. It's called a ball mill. And it takes, in this case, a dual chamber ball mill, where you take and crush it up, and then grind it down into a fine powder that you can then bind with some kind of polymer or glue or some form of binding. There are a variety of ways to do that. Uh, I wish Dr. Taha was here because he could explain it uh, much better than I can. But uh, when you have something that you've already got ground down like this, you can then put a surfactant in with it and you can blow it out through a hose. And if you have a big 3D printer, you can turn that into a building. On Earth, we use a large amount of infrastructure to take those powders, which are, in this case, coal, iron, et cetera, and go through a very complex process to be able to turn that into wire, cables, et cetera. Because remember, if you're on Mars and you didn't bring it with you, you don't have it unless you make it. There's a brilliant MIT doctor by the name of Dr. Sadaway, and he's come up with a system for a smelter that allows you to take the lunar soil or take the Martian soil and then break it out into its components. So you can get out uh, the silicon, the iron, the aluminum, the titanium. You can get <coughs> calcium, manganese, magnesium, uh, even some chromium. And that's one of the problems that we have with Mars is this thing called hexavalent chromium, which is a deadly cancerous toxin. And it's everywhere on Mars. And if you don't have a way to deal with that, you're going to die. So the spacesuits have to protect for that, and you have to take it out of whatever it is that you're going to build. Because otherwise, if you bump up against a wall, you could break off little pieces of it that end up killing you. This gives you a sort of a simple philosophy where you have a ball mill, you grind stuff up, you put it in the smelter, the smelter brings out uh, oxygen. There's also uh, a terrible four to two to four percent, it's uh, dihydrogen oxide, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, uh, terrible <coughs> contaminant. Um, that you can also get out of it. Um, silicon, aluminum, iron, titanium. And then that goes into another ball mill once it's been smelted to turn it back into a powder. Because that's the only form of it you really need on the moon or Mars. Because what you're going to do is you're going to put it into a 3D printer. You're going to have very large additive manufacturing systems that take the powder that you have created, and they're going to turn that back into objects. You're going to print them. You may do a thing called hot isostatic pressing, which takes out the voids and makes it much stronger. Uh, polish, inspect it, assemble that in with other pieces. All of that comes from um, a process where you use a variety of materials all printed together. Because what you don't print together, you have to assemble. If they're printed together at the same time, you're golden. Uh, it can be either wire or powder, whichever is more convenient. 
Uh, Off-world, it's probably more convenient to use powder. That means also you need a subtractive cell to be able to correct deficiencies, things where too much got printed, things where the shape got a little bit bent by the isostatic pressing, um, and still have the ability to uh, assemble that. So eventually you have plants that have both types of additive and subtractive robotic capability that can produce uh, essentially a Ford Econoline van that runs on batteries. So you can produce moon buggies, you can print lawn chairs, you can, I mean, whatever is, is that you need can be constructed with this facility. And now you have an actual commercial infrastructure. You can make things that are useful. You can make spacecraft. And those spacecraft can then become part of the space fleet that expands to fill all of the uh, Earth, Moon, Mars space. You can also use that to make panels. Uh, in this case, concrete panels, which you can then assemble into structures. They can be very big structures, like football stadiums. Uh, one of the proposals is to make a building that's essentially Central Park, that's a big Central Park that you may have other habitats around that you go and you just have a big open air space that you can have trees and an entire environment that is just to relax in for community. You can also use the 3D printing to take that concrete that we made and actually print more habitats. So now you have the ability to start expanding the number of people that you have and support. You can make a real, as I said, commercial product out of all of this. One of those things could be a hotel. So you might have a moon hotel that people go to, or you might have a Mars hotel that people go to. This is one of the points I want to make. We are losing this race. The three largest 3D printers in the world are all Chinese. The three largest supercomputers in the world are all Chinese. Very soon, the three largest rockets in the world will all be Chinese. They are going, and they are going hard, and they know what they are doing. And we do not. They are already building 3D buildings with this technology. They make the 3D printed panels, or they directly build them. This one's actually in Europe, but it's the, the same process. Uh, the United Kingdom is also doing a lot of good work on 3D printing. Uh, seems here in the United States, USC is about the only place that's doing this. They have a contour crafting uh, technology. <coughs> One of the things that we've done is we've taken a type of uh, technology that was designed to reflect radar and uh, infrared and so forth for military purposes, and we scaled it down due to the new uh, capabilities that are available to be able to make a radiation reflective technology, what we call a GCR mirror, galactic cosmic radiation mirror which allows you to tune things to the actual wavelengths that are involved. And when the wave comes in, it gets bounced back out. So we use this uh, in the uh, Martian concrete tungsten's not the right material. You get better results with uh, higher uh, atomic weight elements. But um, for the purposes of this presentation, it will do. That means you have a very large range of uh, spectrum here that you have to cover. And by combining these techniques, we make it so that you have much less radiation exposure in one of our habitats, transporting between Earth and Mars, or in orbit, or on a base, than you do on the Earth's surface itself. You're better protected in space than you are at home.
So, in summary, we adapt to deep space by a variety of technological adaptations. We use the cycler model to allow optimization of each of the components so that a habitat doesn't have any rockets or propulsion on it because it's never going to go anywhere. Okay. Um, now, these one-time, one poorly factored, one-shot solutions are necessary, like in Mars Direct, for the first mission to go there. But they're not the way that we want to build things longer term. Habitation is going to evolve in phases. We're going to transition from providing things from Earth to providing things already there on the moon or already there on Mars. And manufacturing infrastructure, it's not something that you can forget about like NASA does. It's something that's required to be able to implement a civilization. It's required to be able to have an economy. And that's essential to long-term colonization. Thank you for your time and your attention. We have time for a couple quick questions. Two minutes for questions. Anybody? Uh, yes. The caterpillar is a factory of the city. You can put a city on the line and it will be in some capacity. I assume that they are brought to Mars by the process of birds. Yes, but they're extensively modified. For instance, most of the body shell is replaced with uh, structural aerogel. Uh, titanium is used in place of the heavier earth components. Uh, they use electric vehicle technology for their power plants. Uh, they could be, um, and in fact, in many cases, once you had the additive manufacturing up and going, you could manufacture them there. Uh, but uh, the first ones will, of course, have to be built on Earth. Next. Okay, thank you all for your time.